Greetings friends. I haven't released so many videos over the past six months because I'm just tired a lot of the time. I get up at 5.45 or at least 6 in the morning and get home by 6 or 6.30 or maybe earlier than that. I've been working overtime this month. And then you gotta make dinner, gotta eat the food, gotta wash the dishes, make more food for the next day, have a shower, brush your teeth and get ready for bed basically so i might have some time to chill out but all these ideas that i could turn into videos pass me by so in this video i'm just going to put a bunch of them together it's not going to be the most logical way to construct a video but in the circumstances uh, let's do it anyways some of the topics are related some of them are not related but they are tied into my my general outlook the way i see things so hope that interests you and uh, of course I spend a lot of time on X or Twitter no, no one can decide whether to call it X or Twitter so they, they, they just say both now that website which I never used to use because it was associated with lefties just like Facebook would, was but it's changed recently and it is fun to engage with people because those are where you can actually have conversations not real conversations, but communication with people that you wouldn't actually be able to have in real life. Like there's no way I could talk about the things at work that I would might say on that website that would get me fired or that would be very socially negative to do that. And of course, we're going to get to the point where you won't be able to say it online anyways. That'll be interesting. Well, what will happen to people? Will they just lock us up or put us in digital prisons or debank us or disconnect us from the internet? Who knows? I get into these exchanges with people and this is where you really get to see how do other people think how do other people view the world and the topic was the destruction of the painting of Lord Balfour the man who was instrumental or, or very influential in achieving the nation-state of Israel in the mid 20th century on the part of Britain which played an important role in that now, I don't know too much of the history, and I don't have a side that I favor in that conflict, Israel or Palestine. I, I don't really care, to be honest. But I just waded into this discussion because people were, you know, the two sides were arguing. And this was a juicy, fruitful place to get into it because this painting had been defaced or destroyed. It was a painting in the old style. Of this gentleman I guess he was a noble or you know or a successful dude in the British Empire I don't know much more else about him don't care don't consider him a friend or necessarily an enemy be more likely to consider him an enemy or a traitor be if he's working with another tribe which I mean, we know how things turned out in the West it then the uh, the old stock peoples were, were disenfranchised by by treason partly so anyways but not to get distracted by that this is the context and these people are arguing one way or the other and and I just happened to notice one of the one of the lefties who was supporting the destruction of Lord Balfour's painting you know an act of vandalism an illegal act an act that something you shouldn't do I'm not saying like if you disagree, like I, I support I support censoring degenerate stuff. So I'm not going to say there wouldn't be, be a, a situation where you wouldn't want to uh, destroy some things. But in this context, like let's say it's like an enemy, an enemy army and a painting of their general. So you want to go and destroy their painting in the enemy museum or you want to go into the enemy capital and destroy their. It's like well, in that context, I don't know. I mean, you can kind of let something slide and maybe you destroyed okay fine maybe you do maybe you do i can't you know in in total war that happens in in the war in the, in the spiritual war and the cultural war that's going to happen so i can understand that but let's be honest about what's going on here because what interested me was that this lefty this guy he said uh, nothing of historical information is lost with the destruction of this painting and that's what i got to argue over with him that was the point that i could not accept i thought that was absurd and i told him that paintings and art more generally can convey information i said people might even learn primarily through images now that was probably a mistake we learn 
through our ears and speaking and listening. We learn by hearing the spoken language and imitating it, so that's true. I mean, I should have said that we learn primarily through speech and listening, but I do think images are important. And in any case, if he thinks that writing is the main way people learn information about the past or about any topic, and it isn't, it isn't the main way, but let's, let's just grant that it, it, it was, then writing itself is a collection of systematized symbolic images. So you're not getting away from the image, you're just at a different kind of image. I asked him over, I asked him over a dozen times, how do you draw the distinction between a word and an image, between text and a picture? And he would not answer this question. And later I asked him if he thought that something of information or knowledge would be lost if, for, for example, all the ancient Egyptian and Greek statues were destroyed and all these ancient Greek or Egyptian artworks were destroyed. Would we then lose something of historical knowledge? He seemed to think that this was outrageous that I would ask the question, and I can only infer that he believed that indeed something important would be lost if these artifacts were destroyed, but he wouldn't actually express it, he wouldn't admit it. I found that very irritating. You just need to be more honest about these things. And I asked him many times, why is this case of the ancient Greek and Egyptian statues and artworks different from the case of the Lord Balfour painting, which is just a painting of your enemy. And that's okay to admit or to say that he's your enemy and you're going to destroy his painting. And don't act to me also like, well, there's nothing of knowledge being lost here. And yet the lefties, the extreme, the far left is going after these things to vandalize them. If they had no symbolic value, then they wouldn't be going after them. It wouldn't be on their radar. So at least admit that. Okay, so the next conversation, topic number two, is uh, a few months ago. This is longer ago. I was arguing with some guy on X about whether the majority of immigrants in Canada are students. He believed, he actually claimed to have the sources to back this up, that the majority of immigrants in Canada are students. Now, I just found this completely outrageous. Now, I know that there's a huge number of foreign students in Canada. Huge number. Pro how, ma how many million there are? I don't know. But are you telling me it's 90% of the immigrants in Canada are students? No. No, excuse me. No. I don't care what sources you cite. However, these sources are defining students is not honest. This is ridiculous. All you have to do is go out and walk around the street and take public transit in Toronto, which he said he did. And in Vancouver, he said he did this. And in Montreal. He believed, and this guy was not stupid, he was obviously of some education and accomplishment, not much, maybe a bit younger than me, but he really did believe, in, I guess in his liberal worldview, he was on a Ricardo Duchesne thread, so at least, I mean, he was willing to go looking for alternate information. But, I mean, I don't know how else you, you see these things. But he claimed to see this. And, and I was like, on the bus? You're telling me 90% of, like, when I take the bus, you know, usually I take my electric bike. But if I have to take the bus to work, all the people on the bus are immigrants. Virtually every single one meaning they weren't even born in Canada. Let, you know, avoiding even the question of second generation immigrants and how Canadian are they. Like avoiding that question. Just the ones on the bus, like most of these people are not born here, they're immigrants. You're telling me these are students? Are you nuts? Are you like, what's going on here is some of them sign up for courses to learn English and then they're, count then they're probably counted as a student. That's the only way I can imagine that these statistics are generated. And you see, the thing is, he was citing this to say that, well, you guys are exaggerating and on the right, you guys in the right wing 
you your your extreme about mass immigration it's it's not it's not this great thing to replace you because these are students their mo vast majority of them are students so they're educated and they're bringing good skills into the country and many of them are going to go home i mean i don't know he didn't say that but that's what i can only imagine is the inference about why you would want to argue this way when it comes to the question of mass immigration and it and its negative effects on on the society but this is absolutely absurd i'm i'm totally willing to i have no problem acknowledging that there's a huge number of foreign students in this country and even that itself is a problem there's too many foreign students here it's a business students from china from india the ones with the wealth, their parents send them here, and it also contributes to the uh, speculative crisis in housing where properties are bought up by foreign investors and then not occupied and used as uh, assets, basically, for uh, held on, uh, for however they appreciate in value or depreciate, and you can sell them later. And so it, 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 it exacerbates the housing crisis, makes it harder for people to find affordable because some of the stock is already, some of the physical area is taken up already, but that's a different point. So I'm, I'm just trying to say that I acknowledge that foreign students is a huge thing, it's out of control, but even if, it, even if you were looking at it in a positive note, like, oh, it's just foreign students. No, they are, these are not foreign students, these are workers. These are people, generally low-skilled people, and many of them have a good work ethic. Many of them are all right, but it's their foreign cultures and they're generally lower class people from their own countries that are coming here. Now there are higher class people that come as well, but, but we can't get too into the weeds here. But mo basically the point is these are workers coming over here. And if some of them take an English course on the side, that doesn't mean you get to classify them as a student, because that's the only way I can imagine how they, how they come up with a, a statistical loophole to, to, to say that the majority of immigrants are, are, are students. I mean, I, but, I, but even apart from that, like how, how could you possibly see that on the subway or on the bus? How could you possibly see that? How could you possibly look at these, these families from like, like this family from Nicaragua, these Bolivians, and these like Sen Senegalese young men, and then the, these are students. These are like, are you nuts? What the what the heck is wrong with you? So, anyways, that's that was. To, oh yeah, and also on top of that, Canada's population is now 41 million, which is up from 36 million in only 2018. So that's insane. And most of that has gone to the major urban areas, specifically the greater Toronto area and the city of Toronto, which have, I think, absorbed more than a million people in that time. So I'm assuming many of them went to the Brampton and these, these cities in the GTA and these big housing development, these, these uh, well, I used to call them robot neighborhoods when I was a kid. I don't know, maybe they're in high rises, but they're out there in these new developments, probably crammed in there. And... and then you know that's just going to totally alter the ethnic makeup of of the it already has and and canadians who know that they're canadian white canadians christians people who identify with this civilization what are you going to do what are we going to like when is there ever going to be a sense of urgency ever what what is it like is it going to take every single baby boomer to pass away before the next generation starts to wake up and say this isn't i mean then it's already too late but will you do will you do anything even to even to preserve your own people that's my like obviously canada's finished there's nothing like canada ever going to survive again geographically because we've lost every single city but the question is what will you do to preserve your own people in the future? Now, there you could look on the positive side and say, well, how many of the, how many kids do the immigrants actually have in Canada? Like like cities are are fertility sinks. Cities are fertility toxic to, toxic for fertility zones. By living in a city, because of the cost of living, everyone has fewer kids or no kids, and that includes the immigrants after one generation. So that's a that's that could help us. 
I suppose. And then some say, well, man, you know, once the political currents change here, then many of them will go home. Yeah, many of them will go home. But, are you, but I mean, okay, it, that might happen. But when you have like literally several million Indians in this greater Toronto area, they're probably like the largest ethnicity at this point. And that includes Punjabis, which are the Sikhs, and that includes Tamils, and that includes other people from India, like Hindus. That includes all of them and their own ethnic uh, conflicts, which they bring over here. But actually, I wouldn't, I would, see, I wouldn't go too hard on the brown people because generally they get along better with white people because they have, as Dr. Edward Dutton says, they have similar aspirations, white people and, and Indians economic aspirations so they tend to not have beefs as much but 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 in a bigger picture it's going to become like india if you import india here you will have the cleanliness standards of india you will have any cultural issues of india whether positive or negative that's just going to happen with that would happen with any other culture if you did the same thing like with europe the problem is islam because they, that's the one ethnicity that they're really swamped with so anyways 41 million from 36 million in 2018 is ridiculous. There's no way this country can sustain that. There's not enough space in this country. Canada is the a, a second largest territory in the world, but our territory is useless. It's mosquito ridden wetlands, rocky expanses where you can't farm, you cannot use this land, you will be eaten alive by mosquitoes half of the year, and the other half of the year you will freeze. You will have nothing to eat but mackerel and sardines. And it's not worth it, and that's why even white people won't go there. But white people are more equipped to go there, but even they won't go there. So there's not actually that much space in this country, actually. So there you go. And the next topic, I was arguing with this guy, because he said that Russia lost the great... I forget what, what the... Con, it was something about, you know, these, these pro-Ukrainians and the pro-Russian pro side. So, so obviously I have my own bias there. But this guy was... He was taking a stab at Russia, basically. And that's fine. I mean, I'm not, I'm not Russian. But sometimes I might defend the Russian perspective. But he said that Russia lost... The great game, the so-called great game in the 19th century, which was the scramble for colonies, the imperial effort by France, Germany, Britain, and some other, and like Portugal, and well, Portugal and Spain, they kind of had their efforts earlier in previous centuries, but they were still players at that time. But mainly the, the major European powers at that time to gain colonies and maybe take colonies away from falling empires like China and the, the Ottoman Empire. And Russia decidedly lost the great game of the 19th century. That was his claim. Now, I'm not a historian in that era. I do know that uh, Russia fought the Crimean War against an alliance of Britain, France, and the Ottomans in the mid-1850s. And it is claimed that they lost. I, I don't think that's controversial that they... Well, they lost. I mean... I don't know how badly they lost. I can accept that there's truth that they may have lost a certain geopolitical struggle, or, or more than one, with the European powers. Not denying that at all. And, that, and indeed, Russia did not found colonies in Africa and South America and Asia the way the Europeans did. However, I asked this guy, I said, well, okay, but wasn't the 19th century also the time when Russia became the world's largest nation state by land mass? Could you call it a nation state? Well, the largest, yeah, but it was a nation. I mean, there were different ethnicities, but the largest empire or the largest country, let's just say the largest country by land mass in the 19th century. Is that not when it was basically achieved? And again, one of these guys won't give a, he won't really answer the question. He went, he went off on some, some tangent about the great game. And I was like, well, okay, maybe, sure. But, but I just said, and is that a yes? <laughs> and then he didn't know what I was talking about. Is that a yes? So yes, Russia did become the world's 
largest country by landmass in the 19th century, despite your great game or specifications of which you uh, you came up with here. Yes, Russia did not do that like the Europeans did. They did not spread charismatic Christianity into Africa, and they did not spread Roman Catholicism into South America, and they did not do things like found gold mines in South Africa and, and, and that kind of thing. However, they were expanding in their own territory for some hundreds of years prior to the 19th century, but certainly that continued in the 19th century. I do believe that was the time when they finally reached the Pacific. And Russian missionaries, Orthodox monastics, made their way to Alaska in the 19th century. So that was a great achievement for, as a cultural achievement. And I've been reading this book, uh, The Russians and Their Church. It's a history of Russia sort of with an equal emphasis on the, the Orthodox Church amongst the Rus, amongst the Russians, since medieval times, since the baptism of the Rus in Kiev, by the way, like over a thousand years ago. I don't remember all the details. But one of the things that stuck to me was that there were really devoted monastics in Russian history, going back to the early Middle Ages and the High Middle Ages and continuing. And at this time, the Russian peasants had the option of either being a serf or at least a uh, maybe a free peasant, but with many obligations, many heavy obligations, often military obligations, as well as hard work, uh, by remaining in the in the plains and the in the uh, the well developed agricultural areas of the you know the center of the civilization. Stay there, and you'll be a peasant or a serf, and there's a lot of a lot of strains on you. Or go to the forests on the periphery and try your luck there and it would be harder for the landlords to reach you there and tax you and that way there was a lot of freedom expanding in the sense of the wild maybe in the, the way the wild west expanded but not exactly wild because you before the peasants would dare to go there it was the monastics who really went out into the wilderness and they went on their own often and the ones who were really holy and really pious soon attracted followers and they wouldn't often shoo the followers away like oh leave me alone but they'd kind of slowly accept the the formation of a, a community gradually around these monastics and then that would Im that would encourage peasants to come later and in this manner russian civilization spread eastward across eurasia in many ways without military conquest necessary I'm not saying there weren't periods of military conquest. Of course, the Russians had to defend themselves against the Tatars, who were basically the Mongols, it's, and uh, various invasions, and also from the Poles and the Lithuanians and the Swedes to their west. But So there were certainly huge military episodes, and there was a lot of military strife in Russia because it never had a, an easily defendable border. That was always the problem. That's why they in, in, that's why they instituted the czar system, the Caesar system, where, where you would uh, have a very extremely powerful autocratic leader, which continues to this day, as we can see, for necessary reasons. But I'm getting, I'm digressing, but I'm, but I'm allowed to digress because this entire video is, is, is like this. But, they, but the Russians, in fact, didn't need to con conquer all of like Siberia because there was this natural expansion of the civilization following the footsteps of the monks who really laid the, the, the spiritual foundation by going into the wilderness where there were bears and wolves and some hostile pagan peoples as well. And um, so that so so when you're talking about the great game and Russia losing the great game, well, I mean, all of that stuff had had been going on. For hundreds of years and that continued in the 19th century and then i think they built a railway just like canada or america built railways to the other oceans so, so on and they made their way into alaska which is north america so history could have been even different there could have been russia in, like in north america if history played out slightly differently but anyway so that's my thoughts on the great game uh the next topic is um Oren McIntyre and Andrew Clavin. 
Orrin McIntyre, I follow him regularly. I'm a, I'm a fan. Andrew Clavin, I'm, a, I'm familiar with him. I don't watch the Daily Wire because he's a contributor at the very mainstream conservative con inc or conservative containment outlet, the Daily Wire, whose more well-known figure is Ben Shapiro. And the Daily Wire is known for being pro-Israel, and they fired Candace Owens so partly over this issue. I don't care about all that stuff. I don't follow those people. I know who they are, but it's not that's that's not interesting for us. But what is interesting is that Orrin McIntyre did a live stream where he was discussing this reaction, where related to the Israel issue, conservatives. Uh, of different stripes, the antipathy between different people on the right over what they consider to be okay to say when it comes to Christ is King, Christ is Lord. This is an affirmation of Christianity, and of course it's okay and it's good to say this. Now some people might say it with malice as a way to piss off that certain tribe, and maybe that's, that's legitimate, but you can't, therefore, not affirm that Christ is king if you consider yourself a Christian. And that was part of our Western civilization, was being a Christian. That's not even the interesting thing. The thing that interested me is that Andrew Clavin, at one point, he was saying, like, he, he converted to Christianity, even though he's a Jew, Andrew Clavin, and he was saying, I want other people to be Christians too, but... He said maybe Ben Shapiro is doing what God wants him to do in his role. He was basically insinuating that maybe we shouldn't convert everyone or, or, or push the message on everyone because God is working his way through these people who don't follow this Christian religion, who are Jews or who are other or Muslims or Buddhists or whatever. He was kind of saying that, which was a bit problematic, and Orrin McIntyre noticed that. And another thing Andrew Clavin said was something to the effect of, well, these are my people. Like, I'm a, I'm a Christian, but um, these, these are my people. These, like, so I forget what exactly it was, but I've given you the general idea of what Andrew Clavin was saying. And Andrew, Orrin McIntyre, he said something to the effect of, well, I realize, like, like, you, uh, you have your, your tribe, even though you converted to Christianity, but that's going to make you see things a certain way when there's any criticism that could involve your people. That makes sense. And when it comes to telling other people that Christ is king, you have to do that because even though these people have their tribe and you have your tribe, there's something higher than that, which is Christ, which we have to affirm. And, of course, I agreed with Orrin McIntyre. We have to affirm Christ. Even though you have your people and you have your tribe, I have my tribe, whatever, Christ is king over all the tribes. Okay, well, sure, we're on the same page there. But here's the interesting thing. Orrin McIntyre was in a live stream a few months ago. I forget the name of the guy. It was a smaller channel. I think the title of the stream was The Protestant Question, because America has a Protestant history, mostly. People like Warren McIntyre, people on the right, they can recognize the problems with Protestantism because it's associated with liberalism. It kind of goes together with liberalism, and we all know liberalism and the problems that has left us with. Now, the guy interviewing him was, or, or having a conversation with him, I think he was flirting with Catholicism, but he was starting he was starting to realize like, okay, there's tradition, we gotta we gotta think something about theology, we gotta think about the community. But but in that case, Orrin McIntyre was expressing the view that, yeah, this all makes sense with the trads and, and the ortho ortho bros and, and all that. That all make I can I totally get it, but you know, me, I'm a, I'm a Baptist. This is Orrin McIntyre. He says he's he's a Baptist. Those are his people as he puts it. So he's never going to change from being a Baptist because those are his people and that's how he sees things. And Christ is king and the good, the true, and the beautiful. You know, these are things that Orrin McIntyre will say. Like, you know, we have the good, the true, and the beautiful tying us together. At least that gives us definition. I don't mean the Baptists. I mean Americans. But but that's related. So, so okay. Fine. He, he's a Baptist. I can, res I can respect that. 
this is going to work both ways, Oren. Because when you're going to say that uh, you can affirm Christ as king to people from other tribes and other religions, that's, that's good, that's well and good. But I'm also going to affirm that orthodoxy is the one true faith over baptism or whatever it's called, the Baptist, the Baptist church. I'm go also going to affirm that the Baptist church is not the true church. There's only one true church and it's a visible church. It's not invisible. So it works both ways or in, yes, we get to affirm that Christ is king. But actually, when we're considering the Bible and the true faith, we have to think of matters that go beyond just Christ and matters that involve the church because Christ is king and he left us a church on earth. But let's not, you know, go off for 20 minutes on that topic. That was, that was just the point I wanted to make. Maybe someone can mention that to Orrin McIntyre sometime. Now a few more points here. We're wrapping this up. Uh, this is more moving away from this historical religious topics that I've been discussing. But there are things that I notice and I do react to these things. You see these videos online of people giving huge sums of money or, or, um, there, or ex buying expensive products for random people that they just met. And they do it as an act of charity or, or they do it as an act supposedly of charity, an attempt at charity. And for example, they go looking for someone to find to help, right? And they're filming it, of course, because you got to film it. So even that cheapens the whole moment. Even the fact that you're filming it almost cancels the, the whole thing. And I don't believe in karma and all that stuff, but it cancels any positivity that you were trying to get from that. But let's just say, even if, you, even if you didn't do it with the film, there's something not right about it. I'm not saying you shouldn't help people. Sometimes there's like a random situation where that life just throws someone who's unfortunate in front of you and you can help them. But these people, they go looking for something to satisfy some need or some, something unwell that they feel. And they want to go into the world and find someone to help, to make me feel better about myself and my circumstances. That's not a good, that's not a good situation. So for example, let's say some guy had a bike accident, this live streamer or, or this video content producer is filming and he finds the guy and like, Hey man, what happened to your bike? Oh, you got hit by a car. Are you all right? Oh man. Well, guess what? I'm going to buy you. What they, or no, they always frame it a certain way. They say, well, what if I told you that I'm going to get you a $5,000 bike right now? Hey man, thanks. Oh, like the guy, and usually people are thankful. Oh, that's nice. And I don't know what I would do. It's a tough question. I mean, you might want to accept it, right? Especially if you need it, you could use it. Or better yet, if it was money. Oh yeah, then better yet. Yeah, but I don't know. Part of me thinks, would I accept it? I don't know. Part of me thinks I might not accept it. It depends on how desperate I might have to be. But... I don't know. For me, unless I was like really desperate, I wouldn't accept that because it's demeaning. It's because it's not in the proper context of charity. It's subservience. It's positioning you lower. Not that it, not that there's something wrong with being low, lower, but it's an arbitrariness to the lowering of this random person. In the past, charity would be amongst kin groups, against fam amongst family and friends, and the community, and the church, and, and kings had obligations to help, and so did nobles. They had obligations to help people below them. And this continued even in the 19th century. Even the rich barons were under lots of social pressure to donate. And again, that's when it started to get perverted. But even they did things on a, in a way that that is different from today with these mass NGOs who are, what I'm saying is the face-to-face -face reality of charities is totally removed 
and people donate to faceless organizations. Now that's why we get these videos of people want to see someone face to face. They want to get back in touch. It's the same reason people do all this volunteering around the world that I did when I was younger. Partly because they want to get that face to face contact and help someone and it usually doesn't work. But that's why there's this impetus because we want to get back to the face to face giving. I want to, I want to know someone and see someone and, and help them. But it's still fake. It's still super superficial. You don't know them. They're a stranger. You just found them. If you really cared, you would spend time building relationships with people. You wouldn't just try to help one homeless person once. You would try to get to know that, that particular homeless person. You would see him more than once. You might get into a habit of figuring out what he wants and or what he needs, what he actually needs rather than what he wants. <laughs> So that would be way more convincing. It's just so cheap to think you can just find someone and use them as a gimmick to make you feel better and better yet to boost your view count on the internet. It's disgusting. The last topic is just in time delivery is foolish. This is where factories, industries today try to produce everything that they need at the moment or just before the moment when it needs to be delivered. So they won't build up huge stockpiles of any product. My company where I work, we do this and there's never enough to complete orders because so on, it has to be painted here, it has to be cut here. And then, so we were always scrambling at the last minute to get these pieces to complete these orders because it saves a bit of money to the company to do this. But is it actually going to be wise long term? If you all, if there was a change and huge demand came up, how would you adjust to that? This is why Russia is beating the West in the Russo-Ukrainian war, because they have the industrial capacity that would otherwise be considered inefficient because it would eat up large sums of capital to maintain all of these factories producing shells and other military hardware. But because they've built up this giant capacity, they can now put it to good use in a situation when they need it, in a war, a real war. And they're outproducing the West in terms of artillery shells, probably by more than five to one, probably 10 to one. And it's continuing to increase. Just in time delivery is foolish. You need to focus on stocks. It, you can even see this on a basic level. If you need something, it should be ready. You should have it in stock, ready to go. But now you don't want to spend a little bit of extra money just to have these things available. It doesn't make any sense. Hasta luego, amigos.